Good morning, everyone. So here we are, the first day of South Africa's extended lockdown. There's lots of uncertainty in the air, and doesn't it just remind one of Charles Dickens's novel, um, A Tale of Two Cities, where he says it was the best of times and worst of times. It was the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness. And isn't this just timeless because we still suffer from fear and greed, and we have huge divergence between expectations and reality. 150 years ago, that was um, great novelists like Charles Dickens telling us about how to handle expectations and reality. Today, it's Facebook memes. And I think today we can see a lot of that playing out just in terms of technolog technological progress. So if we think of what Bill Gates said recently, where he said we often underestimate the rate of progress in two years and we underestimate the progress over 10 years. And that could be the same with your, your cell phone that you're holding at, at, on the side of your desk. So that cell phone hasn't changed much in the last two years. It's probably the same cell phone you used even two years ago. But if you think about 10 years ago, none of us on this webcast at the moment probably used an iPad even. And today, just think about how much that has changed our lives. And similar advancements have played out in spaces like Amazon with online shopping and businesses like Uber and Airbnb. And the same can be said for investing. In the short term, the noise has us on our toes. And today we have Adrian Pass, who's going to talk to us about this noise and put all this noise into perspective for us so that we can help our clients achieve their financial goals in the best possible manner. And so before I hand over to Adrian, I'm going to just uh, guide everyone through to the qu uh, live event questions and answers on the right hand side of your panel. You will see there there's an opportunity to ask questions. So, so please uh, pop through your questions as the presentation is going along. Arjun will try and address these as we go along and uh, we'll try to answer them um, as aptly and appropriately as possible at the time you ask them. If we can't get to that, we'll answer them towards the end of the event. With that, I'm handing over to you, Arjun. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Dave. Um, can I maybe just remind everyone, um, we this facility to 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 mute that slick or the mute just to avoid some feedback on the system and make the the webinar as slick as possible. Um, yeah, you know, so I think Dave gave a, a good introduction there in terms of where we we stand. Um, in terms of what we want to achieve. So there's been a lot that's taking place in, in markets over the last six weeks in, in particular. Um, we know there's many, many questions out there and, and we wanted to provide some, some context as to um, what's happening and, and what we think um, investors should do um, at, at this point in time. So um, the presentation largely covers four areas. So I want to provide some context and in terms of the pain that we've experienced over the last six weeks in itself. So just review some of the, the key numbers that we've seen. And um, in the second part of the presentation, what I'll do, uh, I'll just try to position why we think this is possibly less important than um, what we think most investors would believe at this point in time. So how would we look back at this event in 10 or 20 years time? Um, that type of a debate. Um, and then I'll go into what we believe the real threats are uh, to creating wealth over the long term, uh, which I think contains some healthy reminders. Um, and, and, and then lastly, from there, obviously, there's many, many questions in terms of where to from here. Um, what should investors be doing? What type of advice should I be giving, etc. So I'll try and give you some, some of my views on, on that. And when it comes to the pain part of the presentation, um, I think uh, all of you are aware of how, how severe the sell-off really really was. It felt like it uh, every every morning you go into the office, you would see what, what the futures market did, um, and then you would know what type of day it was going to be on the South African exchange as well. And we found ourselves 30% down in absolutely no time at all. In 22 days, um, we, we lost 30% of, of the market, which makes it the, the fastest 30% sell-off in, in history. So it was quite severe, and, and obviously from that, it also creates a lot of panic, uh, given the speed at, at which things have, have declined. Um, but the, the speed at which the, the, the drawdown took place was actually quite 
more severe than what the actual extent of that drawdown was. So if you look at this slide, you can see some of the previous recessions um, and, and, and market movements that, 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 that was connected to those. Um, and the average decline um, for each of those larger ones was around 60%, which is quite dramatic. Um, what we saw now, the maximum drawdown um, right to the bottom, at, as far as we've recorded it up to date, was, was 34%. And since the market has recovered a little bit, we don't know what lies ahead, but, but as, as it was recorded here, 34%. So, um, still early days, and let's see. Um, but uh, as, as far as the extent goes, it doesn't look nearly as, as severe as some of the previous cases. If you try to give some further context to, to what we've seen more recently, is if you look at the 50 years of correction since the 1968, so it excludes the, the most recent one, um, you would have seen that there's, there's been 29 corrections over the 50 years between 1968 and 2018, which averages around a, roughly one every, every other year. Um, there were six instances um, where the correction lasted longer than 500 days. So this is then obviously longer than, than, than a year in which you would find yourself in this predicament. And this is just for the correction to find the bottom. It doesn't mean that the correction and the recovery um, is just, just the drawdown part of it. Um, and there were two instances um, which lasted between 157 days and 288 days. But the good news on this is that the, of those instances, there were 21 instances um, where they, they were 104 days or shorter. So typically these corrections tend to be sharp and there's also a correlation between how severe the drawdown is and how long that drawdown typically is. In our case um, with COVID, um, it, it wasn't really the case because it was so sharp as I, as I previously mentioned. Um, but I think the important point to make here is that you know, in some cases, these can last quite long and you need to um, make sure that you've got the right investment horizon and, and, and before you enter equity markets in itself. Uh, you can see on the declines where we are, these are actually quite moderate in relation to what we saw. There's one or two that's more severe and they've taken a bit longer to reach those downs. Um, but, but ultimately, um, I think the, the bigger message here is just to make sure that the right investment horizon is needed in, in order to to invest successfully in equities. Um, the other question is, obviously, if you've got a spread, as, as I indicated on this previous slide, uh, the range is quite substantial. So the majority of the cases show that, you know, it's fairly short lived, that's the green parts, but there are some cases which are red, which are the, the multi-year ones. Um, and then the obvious question is, where do we find ourselves now? So research that we, that we picked up last week through um, um, the guys from Goldman Sachs, is where they try to look at different types of uh, bear markets. And they broadly categorize these into, into structural, cyclical, and event-driven. Um, structural just meaning very briefly, um, it's a bubble of sorts. Um, so that would be closer to the global financial crisis of 2008. Cyclical would be something that's more connected to um, the business cycle or economic cycle. So you would see interest rates rising, et cetera. So I think that was what everyone was anticipating with yield curve inversions last year, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately what, what did happen, while everybody was waiting for that cyclical event and the downturn and, 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 and interest rates, what we did see was um, an event-driven um, bear market, which was caused now by, by COVID. The, the good news out of that, though, is that typically these um, these event driven bear markets tend to have smaller declines. And uh, we refer to the 34 percent and that puts us more in line with with what the average would be. So that that box we, we tick. Um, and then in terms of the average length, they tend to be tend to be much, much shorter. So typically around six to eight months. Um, for, for event driven ones and the time to recover consequently is also then um, shorter. So, um, you know, I think each case has its unique set of circumstances, but I thought it was quite useful. Um, we, we know that many clients are, are currently asking and wondering um, if history is anything to go by. Um, this does provide some, some peace of mind. What we also saw is that um, global GDP forecasts are slipping very quickly. Um, this was um, the International Monetary Fund that came out with um, uh, guidance uh, earlier this week. 
And you can see so it's actually some interesting observations that they make here. So they look at the global economy and they expect a 3% a pullback for, for the year and then a higher bounce back um, next year. So, so that's largely then in line with the previous Goldman Sachs case where they say, you know, they expect this to be fairly short lived. This is not going to be for, for years ahead. So, and, and obviously this 5.8 recovery is then off the lower base that's created in the current uh, calendar year. Um, the, the interesting observation for me was that advanced economies are not only set to, to take a bigger hit than, than emerging economies, but the recovery uh, that, got, that they see following in two, uh, 2021 is going to be more moderate than for emerging markets. So I think this already makes a fairly decent case for, for looking for opportunities in emerging markets, at least from the perspective of, of international investors. Um, it does sort of signal that uh, this is a potentially area that, that we need to look in. Um, you know, I think these numbers are, are quite fluid at the moment. We saw China come out yesterday. They, they recorded 6% year on year uh, growth for each quarter, I think for the last three or four quarters. And yesterday, then the numbers came out at a decline of 6.8%. So as far as I can recall, I don't think I've ever seen a pullback in Chinese GDP numbers at all, never mind a 6.8% a pullback. Um, and in South Africa's case, you can also see um, where, where these um, forecasts are slipping quite quickly. So you can see with the previous monetary policy review that was done in October last year, that's where they came out at. Um, it was then updated in March um, following uh, COVID and they expected a dip and then um, I think this this came out last week. Um, they then readjusted that down to, to closer to 3% decline for, for the year and then a bump back. So again, I think you can see from an economic perspective at least, um, it's definitely a case where these are, are V-shaped type of recoveries and then we'll have to see what markets do. But I think that that, that should bode well for for, for markets to uh, typically read through through the noise. Um, if we look at some of the direct cost of the of the lockdown, if you look at the GDP numbers across the board, um, obviously all the sectors have suffered. There's nothing that's going to um, go unscathed through a period like like this, and and that's where the that broadly two two point six and a number came from. Um, and of greater concern is that. Um, the Reserve Bank is expecting roughly 370,000 formal sector uh, job losses uh, during the year. Um, so that, that would mean that our unemployment rate just on this front would escalate from 29% to 34%. So that's a, that's a big knock into an area that's already quite sensitive to, to, to any bad news. Um, so really not good. So you can understand um, why they, they really are um, acting as quickly as what they, they have been with, with interest rates, et cetera. So I'll get to more, more detail on that. And then the other thing is um, they expect roughly 1,600 more business insolvencies in 2020. So we can see the same pressures that's, that's experienced globally in other countries, um, where in particular SMEs are under pressure, but even larger corporates in the formal sector space under pressure. Uh, all the sectors are under pressure. Um, the areas that do do tend to suffer quite a lot areas uh, that that's closely related to to trade and entertainment and travel and those kind of things. We you will see that um, report very bad numbers from a economic data set point of view. So we should expect economic data sets to to look quite bad over over the, the next quarter or so um, while things are under pressure. So very anomalous type of data numbers that's going to come through. Uh, things that come to mind would be the the Chinese growth numbers from yesterday. Um, I think some of you would have seen um, a, a, a set of data that's been reported more frequently is the uh, initial jobless cut claims through the US. So that's um, all previously employed people who are uh, jobless who then um, submit their first claims. Um, this week came out at just over 5 million. Uh, the previous two weeks were both well in excess of 6 million. And before the crisis, they were hovering around 280,000 per week. So, you know, these are massive, massive jumps. Um, and I think if it wasn't the case that we, we've we seen the stimulus um, in the US that we have seen, um, you know, it's it's likely that, that, that um, the GDP declines would have been close on, on, on that double digit level for the US, which obviously has repercussions throughout the globe. But 
you can see this is why they've been so aggressive in terms of um, stimulating the economy. So even in the last six weeks that we've seen this, um, this pressure, they've already stimulated more in, in terms of fiscal stimulus um, than what they did through the through the three year period that followed from 2008 to 2010, which is this blue bar. So remember, government spending is an underlying component to to GDP growth. So any money that they that they that they're using at the moment to put back in the economy will 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 obviously help very directly um, to keep the GDP numbers afloat. And then the the secondary round effects will obviously mean that people will stay employed or less insolvencies, etc. So very important work um, in terms of the stimulus that's taking place uh, at at the moment. And you can see this This is something that's been happening. Uh, this is now specifically for the uh, G7 countries and across the spectrum, everyone has been very proactive on fairly fairly uh, tight timelines to, to, to jump and, and, and react. If you look at, at monetary policy, so interest rates in particular, um, you can see what happened in 2008, higher interest rates, and the same thing happened. So they're trying to, to keep the economy going with lower interest rates. And just as we saw some interest rate normalization picking up, um, we, we hit a new crisis, and that's now um, reverted on itself. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll probably see this. Uh, for a for extended period of time, a lower interest rate environment. And then if you look at the, the G3 interest rates in particular, uh, weighted US, Euro and Japan, effectively we're looking at 0% at, uh, interest rates um, in, in, in those economies. Um, the good news is that um, firstly, emerging markets also have some, some room to move, uh, maneuver. And secondly, South Africa has actually led the way. So, um, this is now actually been a dated graph, so I apologize for that. But things are moving rather quickly. Um, this is South Africa still at the 100 basis points cuts, and we know that earlier this week they moved to 200 basis points. Some of the other emerging markets have followed as well. So emerging market policy rates are also adjusting downwards and quite aggressively so. And, and the good news is that no one is really experiencing any inflation in emerging markets. So there's room to, to, to cut this down. Um, and obviously with growth under pressure in itself, we can expect inflation to, 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 to be under pressure um, as, as well. So there's obviously the question around what's gonna happen if they push all this capital into the economy, um, there, there should be a, an eventual inflation consequence. And I think that's that's a very valid question. But I think for the time being, um, you know, I think that the expectation is that a large component of that will be offset through um, through GDP growth that's, that's, that's under pressure. Okay, so that largely puts the existing situation um, into some perspective, but I, I wanted to, to, to comment in terms of uh, why I think it's all relative in terms of what you think is important in terms of a long-term investment plan. And I think that the sense that, that, that I get is that um, if you accept that, that yes, this yellow dot is, is, is COVID, it feels like we are in this space here. We're giving it a disproportionate amount of attention. I'm not saying it's not a serious problem. Um, it has very real issues in, in the real economy, but I'm more commenting in terms of a, a 50 to 60 plus year investment plan. Um, why is this taking such a large portion of our time? There's actually much bigger issues out there that, that we also need to be be mindful of, which I'll which I'll come back to. And then something else that 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 I think also helps to try and explain my point is that I think uh, clients are moving into this space where they're focusing on days now. Uh, you know, each day comes with its own set of news. There's no scarcity of news or news flow, um, and uh, that myopic type of thinking where people just focus on the short term is now really becoming the the the, the approach that that's being followed. Um, but what we should be doing is focusing on, on decades. That's what we do in a, in a wealth management business where we formulate long-term plans. Um, and then we need to keep clients on track with that. So additional perspective on that, um, if you look at the 15 year total return performance as at the end of March, so this even takes into consideration uh, a very significant portion of the drawdowns. Um, over this 15 year period, you can see the Aussie return was 11.6%, which is roughly 6.3% um, ahead of inflation, which is 
aligned with our um, financial planning philosophy, where we assume equity growth to be roughly inf inflation plus six or seven percent. So on that front, uh, just again emphasizing that even despite the fact that uh, we've actually seen two uh, crises, uh, substantial crises between 2008 and now the most recent one, um, equity returns at the end of March were still actually quite fine. Where you do pick up problems was um, on something like resources, for example, because we saw the end of the commodity super cycle. And that, that sector has been under pressure for a significant period of time. On the other end, we saw RAND edges do quite well as the RAND came under pain for a lot, a lot of the, the time during this period. And so you would have seen things like nice bash, et cetera, do quite well over this period of time. But if you maintain a diversified equity portfolio, you would have been just fine. In fact, if you look at cash, um, that actually generated inflation plus 2% and your bonds inflation plus 2.3%. So I, these these returns are almost exactly what we use in our um, models with um, the financial planning side with with Taz and Harat and the team. Um, so still perfectly aligned with our, our longer term plan, even given the fact that we've had these um, two pullbacks um, within this uh, period. Um, this is a more technical graph, but it looks far more complicated than, than what it really is. It just says that why do we why do we see returns mean revert over time? So typically, yes, we understand that the range of equity returns would be somewhere in this funnel over the short term. So what we've done here is to take the average equity return over longer periods, and then we've added a, a, a movement of a one and a half standard deviation at the end, top and bottom. So you should pretty much expect equity markets to give you anything between minus 15 and 40 percent in any given year. If it does meaningfully below that, so 2008, it was just under 20 percent. It's actually a buying opportunity for you because it, if returns were to mean revert as they have and move into this funnel, then you've got a great opportunity. Um, and, and contrary to what clients often think is if you were to see markets rally by 40 or 50 percent, it's actually expensive and, and means that markets could be running ahead of themselves. And something else if it's on the back of a recovery. So you had a tough period of time and you're recovering from there. But if there's a blow off in, in equity markets and they're running ahead of themselves, typically what you should consider doing is, is, is uh, downweighting some of your, your risk exposure, um, which would typically be done through, through the underlying managers in our, in our funds. But uh, what this does tell you is that, you know, expect returns over the short term to have fairly wide ranges. And over time, you should move closer to that um, long term average. What we have seen now more recently with a correction is that this dropped off slightly. But that's not actually become, to our minds, a signal that it is potentially a buying opportunity. Um, and if you look at the feedback that we've been receiving, uh, we've been meeting with um, all our managers now um, since the lockdown, it's offered us um, opportunities to um, really engage quite effectively on, on technology with all our underlying managers and catch up with them. Um, and in, in all cases, the guys are definitely more optimistic um, than what they were previously, which is in line with the expectations because um, prices have obviously deflated, offering better um, entry points. Um, if you look at this is a, a, a schematic from um, from the guys from Goldman Sachs Asset Management. And, and effectively, it gives you a similar message to say, um, essentially, they call this frequency of positive total return. So depending on how many observations you have or data points you have, how likely are you to actually record a positive return? And you can see over the short term, it's really 50-50 um, with some of these risky assets. And, and even if you look at something like, like global high yield um, or debt markets, even in that case, um, those returns over the short term can be 50-50. But if you if you give something in a fixed interest space, say five years, uh, and you you give the the equity side of things ten years, you have a very very high likelihood of recording a positive return. And if you give it longer than that, then obviously return should mean revert to the level where you you actually get the return that was that was forecasted based on on the long term fundamentals. And if you start to think of it this way, uh, then you can actually start to see that. Um, Cash all of a sudden becomes one of the riskier asset class because it's actually the one that has the highest probability of not beating inflation over the long term. And that's maybe a different change in the mindset as to how this, this situation should be viewed. 
Uh, looking at um, expansions and recessions, again, we, we love to, to talk about recessions, um, but you know, the expansions are far more frequent in time and far more powerful. And, and these are the things that drive earnings of companies and equity returns. So if you look at this schematic since the since 1950, there's been um, 11 economic expansions, um, which are these uh, at the top, and then um, 10 recessions uh, over that period. Uh, and then uh, typically what you would see is these recessions on average um, contract by 1.8% on GDP, which is really not a lot. So that's the, the number that you see there. And then um, in terms of the expansions, these expansions are typically uh, 67 months. So it's, they call it five and a half years odd. Uh, and the growth that you would see over that period is on average 24.3%. So the expansions are, are far more powerful than these short interruptions in, in time. But it's also important to know that you can't just continuously have expansions over time. The, um, you do have business cycles and economic cycles that take place. You do have crises in, in markets. Um, so you're going to have these events. Um, but a really important point to make is that, if anything, they um, make for fantastic entry points. So where you do, do see these, um, these pullbacks, um, they make, as I say, for great entry points and, and typically also obviously um, not great um, exit points. So do, where we do see clients panic and move money to cash, it's probably now um, the worst thing that, that that you could be doing for, for multiple reasons. But uh, firstly, there's actually good um, value on offer in, in the equity space. And at the same time, it's highly unlikely that cash returns are going to generate any, anything near um, inflation if you t take into consideration charges and taxes. Um, if we then, I uh, think some of you would have seen the, the special report that we did on on the the FTSE and um, S&P pullback. So for those that, that missed it, um, it, these red dots at the bottom is the maximum drawdown for each calendar year since 1996 on the JSE. Um, and then the blue bars is what was actually recorded throughout the, the, the year, so um, for, for the 12 month period. And you can see over this 25 year period, there were 13 years in which the drawdowns ranged between 10 and 20%, and an additional nine years in which the short term pullbacks were larger than 20%. Um, so, I mean, these things are perfectly normal. They are unpleasant to go through, but, um, you know, equity markets on, on cash markets, unfortunately, you do need some exposure to, 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 to this asset class in order to get to um, inflation plus type of returns over time, especially now. Um, but I think the best thing that, that you can do, um, both as an advisor and as a client, is to really understand this dynamic. These things are going to take place and, um, you should expect them well ahead of actually investing. And this is not um, different to, to what you would see on the S&P. So we've done exactly the same thing on the, on the S&P. And you can see um, the drawdown year to date, that's the 34%. There's been a, a bit of a recovery since then. And uh, you can see in some cases the, the drawdowns are actually quite significant. So some interesting observations there. So you can see this at 34 percent as well, and they managed to finish the year slightly ahead. So pullbacks are perfectly normal. I'm not saying we should expect to finish the year ahead or not. I, I honestly don't know. But what I can tell you is that if you invest in equities, you should expect pullbacks on a very frequent basis. And in some cases, you should expect pullbacks well ahead of 30 percent uh, reasonably often. Okay, so I think if I if I'm trying to make the case that that we we should put this um, COVID-19 crisis and the downgrades and everything else that we 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 have on our investment journey into into context, um, am I saying there aren't any any real threats to to investing? I think obviously from an investment perspective, the the, the market risks are, are navigated um, by the, the fund managers and the guys in the multi-management team look after the stuff as well. Um, and obviously, if you follow the right advice process, by the time you've deployed the funds and used the right funds, I think you're okay because a, a lot of the underlying work is being done on an active basis. 
Um, but what are the risks that clients really should keep in mind um, right now? And I think when you're in a time of crisis like we have now, I think it's a very good time to to remind clients of what the real risks are to their, abil to their ability to create long-term wealth. Um, some of these things are things that, that I've spoken of before. Um, you'll recall um, last year we did a, a War and Wealth Roadshow. Um, so I've, I've refreshed some of that content here as well. But essentially the three things that I think um, all investors should acknowledge is these are the long-term risks. These are not things that um, you know, surface every other year like a recession. These are not things that, um, that, that go away. These are the things that you should have a fairly solid plan for um, in, in your, in, in your discussions with your financial advisor. So the one is the, um, uh, uh, the retirement income shortfall crisis, so risks uh, ends with the C, and then inflation and then emotions. So I'll go over these fairly quickly. Um, and they are fairly basic things in terms of um, uh, explaining them, and they might feel elementary to you, but I think we should never underestimate how important it is to remind our clients of these things, because right now, this matters much more than what COVID-19 does. So just a reminder, if you look at the retirement income shortfall crisis, um, you'll see here what is the, the gap in trillion dollars. Um, that was experienced in 2015. So even at that time, the total shortfall that was recorded in terms of uh, provision for retirement. So they take the actual savings and they calculate what they should be in terms of um, what is the actual um, liabilities from, from pensioners, and then they calculate the gap. And you can see the gap here was uh, 70 trillion. And this gap is, forecasted to to grow to 400 trillion by 2050 and obviously you would expect this now to be under even more pressure given that these um, economic growth pressures that we are experiencing but to, to put this into context um, what we've seen in 2008 was roughly a, a 2.8 uh, trillion us dollar loss in markets for for 2008. Um, so it's a fraction of, of the problem that we see here. What we've seen now more recently is probably closer to a 7 trillion um, loss on global equity markets, uh, so worldwide, which is a substantial number, but it's still a drop in the ocean in terms of this bigger problem that we, that we have right here. Essentially, what I'm saying is that th this problem to get from, from, from a level where it's going to grow from, from 70 to 400, means that um, it grows by $28 billion every 24 hours. So that would be more or less a, a COVID crisis every six months from now till 2050. This is a much, much, much bigger problem um, as it speaks to under provision um, in the retirement fund system. Um, I've mentioned the OECD numbers before, where they've also flagged this as one of the major risks to, to, to wealth and growth in economies. Uh, I think the, the stat from, from our own treasury, where they say that only six for each hundred individual, individuals will be able to, to retire um, based on existing forecasts also reiterate some of those, those risks. On the inflation side, again, you guys would be familiar with this. So, because um, uh, this is one that came out of the, um, the war and wealth presentation. Um, but if you go back to 1983, Wimpy Cheeseburger would have caught you two rand thirty. Uh, if you were then to, sorry, if you were then to, to forecast that forward, so you can see, um, and uh, that, that basically, if you look at the prices today, it's 59 rand ninety. Um, when I updated the slides from last year, it was 58 rand 90, now it's 59 rand 90. So it's a more or less a 9.1% increase per annum in the price there. If you were to invest your 2 rand 30 in cash in 1983, you would sit with 23 rand 73 because the cash the growth assumption that we used is 6.5% over time, which I think in the existing scenario is obviously quite uh, generous. But uh, over time, that's more or less what we expect which means you would be able to replace roughly 40% of that, that expense. 
So if you have any hope of um, enjoying a wimpy cheeseburger in retirement, you're going to have to do something else than invest just in cash. If you invest just in equities at an assumed rate of 10.5%, which I think is actually quite conservative, um, you would get to 99 rand uh, and just over that and 1.65%. And so a little bit extra to, to share. And if you use the balanced portfolio of 65-35, you would get to that same 9.1%, which means you would, able, you would be able to, to replace that, that expense going forward. So it just goes to show that you, you, you need to think of inflation. Uh, you can't now be scared of what's happening in markets and be allocating your retirement funds into cash. You're going to do a whole lot of harm. And without knowing it, you're actually taking a whole lot more risk. You might be avoiding risk this year, but you're actually introducing a lot of long-term risk into your portfolio. Um, and something else that's interesting, I was actually sent this uh, last week. If you look at a, a kilogram of lamb, it's in 1 Rand 68. This is going back to, to 1979. That was a big surprise to me. I think most of us enjoy a good bra. But if you if you try to calculate what that number was, if you I've used 150 Rand in today's term, it's 11% growth. So if you if even if you invested in equities at that 10.5%, you wouldn't be able to replace it. And the point that I'm trying to make here that it's not just about the asset mix. Yes, you need the right asset mix. If you need something more balanced, you're going to need some equity exposure to some extent. But you're also going to need very regular contributions in order to make sure that you actually have a decent retirement pool. And I think most people are focusing purely just on the growth side. Um, what are markets going to do? I think you should challenge your clients and say, what are you doing at the moment? What are you doing about your income levels? And what are you doing in terms of making new contributions? Um, there's only so much that can be done in terms of getting the asset mix right. And that part we can fix, but it's not the solve for everything type of uh, scenario. And then lastly, emotion, which is also something that features in, in most of the presentations that, that, that we do internally, just because in a wealth business, it's a significant part of what we do. So we don't just look at the investment component. We need to understand how clients interact with the investments. And we always refer back to the studies of Dalbar, uh, Morningstar's Mind the Gap, um, the Baird studies, and then the five key biases. Um, and essentially what we, what again, the point that we make is that investors always make this mistake where they try to um, time the market and get out at points where it's actually fairly cheap and then invest when it looks more attractive. And that's a recipe for, for poor investment outcomes. So to summarize that section, section um, the, the three key risks there for, for us is um, retirement income shortfall. Make sure that you continue investing, even through this very difficult period of time. Um, it's actually a very attractive opportunity. Um, if you start to, to do silly things like deviating from your plan and putting your, your cash with the in a bank account, um, those are things that can really hamper your, your long-term prospects um, quite, quite a lot. Be aware of inflation, don't be too conservative, um, and keep your emotions in check. Review your plan again and make sure um, that you understand what your longer-term goal is. Your goal is not to avoid COVID. Your goal is to build wealth over time so that you can aff afford to retire comfortably. So I've got nine, nine things that I think we need to tell clients right now in terms of where to from here. I think first of all is don't try and time the market. I think, you know, we do have um, investors who want to, to in invest everything in cash. And we also unfortunately have investors who now want to invest everything in equity. So both typically happen. What we, what we say is don't try and time the market or forecast the market. If you've got a long-term plan and you've got the right asset mix to deliver your um, required return or deliver your goal through a cycle, then just stick to that. Um, by trying to, to get in and out of the market a different period of times, you start to introduce the risk that you, you miss some of the days. And there's just no way that you can accurately forecast this. So even if you were now to just miss um, the 10 best days, um, you start to compromise the, the, the returns. And even more so if you start to do that more actively. Make regular contributions. I think this is also, again, very important. This is something that was sent on by one of the advisors. So thank you uh, very much to, to Heinrich who sent this. Um, Essentially, what, what this basic exercise just does is to say, say these three investors who invest $10,000 um, each year, 
Um, the, the one with perfect timing at the, at the top, invest at exactly the, the, the weakest point of the market for that year, where the one with no timing just invests on the, on the 1st of January, um, and the poorest time invest exactly at the market peak for, for that specific year. And you can actually see in terms of the returns over time, um, since 1976 to 2016, it doesn't actually make a, a big difference when you start to rent cost average into markets um, like that. It's far more important to, instead of waiting on the sideline for a year or two, just continue to make those regular contributions to, to your savings. Uh, the other thing is um, also, obviously, I, I suspect you guys might get a lot of questions around um, when exactly will it be ended? Do you think it's a good time to enter the market right now, etc.? cetera? Um, essentially, if you look at this graph, what it's saying is if, if you're early um, and you, you enter markets here, and this, even if there's still a significant drawdown, don't think of this in terms of percentages, in terms of how much money you'll lose on the way down. And, 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 you know, it would take a bit of time, obviously, to make that up. Essentially, what this says is, even if you were to, um, to, to, early, um, to, to be an early entrant, it, you're most likely going to lose, in terms of days, six months um, before you reach a similar level than an investor that got his timing spot on. So it's much, much better to just um, keep to the plan. If you've got money to invest, it's a good time. Broadly speaking, it's a good time to, to be investing. We don't know exactly where we will be here, but it, it won't be harmful in terms of your returns to be, to be early. At worst, you'll have to wait a little bit longer to make that recovery. And that long, longer wait is not being a question of years, it's going to be a question of months. Um, so I think that's also quite important. Um, also, when returns and contributions suffer, invest for longer. So if you're running into a situation where your returns are under pressure, typically the only other levers that you can pull is to up your contributions or invest for longer. If you're in a position where your business can't afford to invest or you can't afford to invest, then unfortunately make peace with the fact that you'll have to delay your retirement or have to invest for a little bit longer than what was initially um, expected. These are the only three levers that we can pull to try and create wealth over time. So what typically happens is when returns start to suffer, then the contributions suffer as well because clients don't want to invest. And actually what they should be doing is they should be upping this contribution, otherwise they will have to save for longer. So I think that's also, again, a very important thing. So for clients who have the ability to invest right now, it's an attractive entry point and that they should really consider taking advantage of the opportunity. For clients who are already in retirement, a uh, difficult discussion maybe to have, but an important one is to watch the income levels at this point in time. You don't want to, try to be taking an excess, excessive level of income. So uh, some of you might be familiar with this, uh, with this table from ASISA, which looks at the different living annuity withdrawal rates, the different expected um, returns going forward and how long in terms of years that capital will last. So obviously if you have high withdrawal rates and low returns, uh, typically the, the, the returns don't, don't last very long or the capital doesn't last very long. Um, but what we're saying is the best thing that you can do right now is in a re low return environment, try and scale back on your income levels if you're in a position to, 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 to do that at all. And don't forget who wins the race in the end. So um, again, uh, the, the research from Triumph of the Optimist, the three professors from London Business School, a fairly well-known piece, um, piece of research. Essentially, it says, doesn't matter in which geography you look, it doesn't matter over what period you looked. Um, generally, if you're going to invest for a longer period of time, equities will outperform other asset classes. So yes, your equities are under pressure. I myself looked at my uh, quarterly statement that, that was in my inbox and it doesn't look great. But I understand my longer term journey and I understand where I'm going and I understand that there's actually a great opportunity there and it's not the right time to be um, a bit overly conservative. Diversify, so it comes back to the point um, of don't now be trying to be brave and investing only in equities or be scared and only in cash, but just maintain a diversified portfolio that offers you the asset mix um, that's suitable for your goals. And then obviously 
with managers in particular because the, the spread in returns between the best performing managers and the worst ones is also obviously increasing in this type of environment where we see um, massive jumps across asset classes as well. So maintain a diversified portfolio of assets and managers and manage volatility where you can. Where you can. So don't manage volatility by changing your plan and making it more conservative. What we can do is by giving you the ability to still generate the, the return with the required asset mix. At least by, by investing in the solution, we do give you relatively less volatility. So this is, if you look at the sector, um, this is the most volatile portfolio in the, in the sector, the least. Um, and you will see typically, um, as per our promise, we uh, try to give you um, returns at, at below average risk. Um, so manage vol where you can without compromising your your asset mix and your uh, forecasted returns. And then lastly, from my side, is find comfort in the in the valuations on the table. So SA Inc feels to me like it's a bit of a swear word at the moment, but if you look at um, the valuations there, and it's not just SA Inc. It doesn't really matter where you look at at this point in time. There's a lot of value everywhere. But we're seeing valuations, um, price to book values of, of SA Inc stocks at 0.84%. So it's ridiculously cheap levels at, at this point in time. It's been painful to go to that level, but the worst thing that you could do is exit now. Um, just hang in there. It's tough. Um, fortunately, the life of a long time investor is full of suffering over time. Um, but if you can at least manage the expectations and expect those, then it makes it a little bit easier. The good news for our multi, <clears throat> excuse me, our multi-asset portfolios is that if you look at the other asset classes, they are also very, very cheap at the moment. Um, the only exception would be um, cash, both locally and and abroad, or actually abroad would be broader than that. Fixed income in general, um, cash rates locally, um, we all know where that stands. But if you look at um, valuations for essentially all equity sectors. Um, even things like brief shares, although obviously we've always said use those in sparingly, rather leave it up to the underlying managers to allocate their um, property and bonds in this case. So we now see the 10 year government bond consistently yielding above 10%. We're expecting inflation to be even through the cycle, it's going to be lower over the short term and then we'll probably start to pick up again. Through the cycle, we're probably looking at around four and four and a half percent. If you buy a 10 year bond now at 10 and a half percent, you're getting inflation plus six percent, which is equity like returns that you're getting out of your bonds. So there will be um, a decent mix of assets in our multi asset portfolios. You don't need to to go from a, a moderate to a creator, et cetera, to, to try and, and, and churn up a little bit more return. Um, like I've been saying a couple of times now, just stick to that long term plan and your risk profile. Um, I think inve investment returns over the next five to 10 years should be significantly better for South African investors um, in comparison to what they've been over the last five to 10 years. So that's my story. Um, Dev, I'll leave it over to you to maybe just pass on a few questions. I can unfortunately not see them, but uh, okay, we'll hand them over. Okay, great stuff. Thanks, Adrian. Um, can you hear me? Can you? Okay. Um, so if I can quickly just look at the published questions. Um, so when engaging with clients, we need to manage expectations. Um, when investing it as opposed to saving, um, riskier assets are obviously the way to go. Um, has our recommendation on minimum investment periods changed? Could you maybe talk a little bit about uh, investment horizons on growth assets and multi-asset portfolios? Yeah, sure. Um, I think our expectation is still for 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 uh, returns to to mean revert in line with the uh, the the focus that we do have. Um, I think what we, we what we have seen is um, obviously the downgrade has has now meant that the the cost of capital is going up and the risk is going up. So um, you you will experience higher returns on your on your bonds because you're being compensated for the higher risk of, of uh, associated, associated with owning them. But also because the cost of capital is going up, you'll see inflation go up. So essentially in that space, our, our, our feeling is that the, the 
inflation adjusted uh, real return will be more or less the, uh, the same. Um, cash rates, I think, you know, you, you should probably, I mean, the income fund is, is not something that you can use over a 12 month period for clients income needs. Um, and this period has again shown uh, why that is uh, these instruments there that can mark down um, and that we've seen across the income space. I think if you look at the last three months, it's a negative return in there. So unless your client is willing to accept that it wouldn't be suitable for, for income needs. So enhanced interest, even though the, the, the yields on the money markets are now um, going down very, very quickly, um, I wouldn't necessarily change anything in terms of who, who uses what bucket. I wouldn't start using income bucket um, instead of enhanced interest, for example, for, for that additional uh, three or four percent that you're going to return out of there. Um, and on, on the equity side, I think we, if, if anything, I think over a shorter period, just given that there's going to be a correction um, upwards, I, th I don't think we, we can start to say what we want in our forecast equity returns to be inflation plus eight or nine percent, for example. I wouldn't do that because what we try to do with that advice process is to look through the cycle. Um, and if we go back to that 15 year chart that I showed, I mean, there were many, many cycles through that. 2008 was initially bad, but we didn't adjust our equity expectations lower. Then 2009 in March, the recovery started. We didn't adjust the expectations higher because we look through the entire cycle and we say we expect inflation plus six or 7%. And like I said, over that period, we ended at 6.3%. So we're okay with that. I think we create actually more confusion by trying to adjust this too often. Um, you know, if there's really good reason for doing so, then, then, then we go ahead. But I don't think we find ourselves in that situation just yet. Thank you. And talking of cost of capital, um, so there are rumors and we've seen lots of media reports around uh, potential IMF bailouts for South Africa. Uh, what does this mean for South Africa? Um, you know, is this something that should be of concern and um, can the world actually tolerate taking on more debt? Yeah, you know, I think that's probably going to be the, the next major route that, that, that we'll see. Um, so obviously balance sheets are being built up to, to, to very large levels, especially um, abroad. Um, IMF has already actually um, announced the bailouts and they've opened themselves up to a special uh, frontier markets program, which we, we would be able to participate in. Um, uh, from what we see um, being reported is that there's actually already a few countries that's applied for that support. And it, it won't surprise me at all if South Africa was going to go in that direction. Um, regardless of where the funding is going to come from, our, our balance sheet doesn't look great. And it's it's um, uh, it's difficult to see exactly where that improvement is going to come from. I mean, the market recovery is one thing because asset prices are cheap. But at, this, at the same time, if we look at the debt levels, they don't look great. Um, and then to to make that worse is that the cost of capital through the bonds that's that's being issued at right now is actually quite expensive. And at the same time, the offshore debt's also getting expensive because the currency is so weak. So that's a massive problem for for us in particular. Uh, I think the one the, the one good sign out of that though is that what we have seen is a lot more. What I would think um, just honest recognition of the, the dire state of affairs through the new leadership. I mean, we've seen a, a lot of new types of approaches being applied here over the last 18 months, things that we wouldn't have easily expected in, in, in previous years. So I'm talking about, I mean, obviously more recently, the 200 basis points cut. Um, the, the whole concept, if you look at the budget speech, speech of um, relieving the consumer and actually providing tax relief as opposed to just adding on top. Um, having difficult discussions with labor unions um, where wage growth is a, is, is a problem. So those difficult things we're doing, I think we're doing more of the right things, but there's no doubt we've got a, we've got a massive mountain to climb. But I think in previous times it felt like, you know, ignorance was bliss. And I think in, in the existing state, it feels like the guys are panicking alongside the, the rest of us and 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 that's a good thing we need to sort out our fiscal affairs uh, very very quickly thanks adrian um, i'll just ask one more question so dividend policies are being tested by 
by government's announcements about holding back uh, dividends. Uh, we see the real estate REIT sector coming under pressure in terms of uh, rentals not being paid by, by even anchor tenants. Um, you know, what's your thoughts around the property sector and, and people, investors who are traditionally looking for income out of dividend payouts? You know, I think it's a very difficult time. I mean, we obviously run our, our own dividend growth uh, type of portfolio through the portfolio committee as well. And typically what you want to have exposure to is guys who increase their, um, their, 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 their dividends um, in absolute levels over time. And in the existing environment, that's just not the case. So even in the case where banks are reasonably well capitalized, they being requested by by regulators to to rather cut back and be conservative, which I think is actually the prudent thing to to do in in, in this space. You, you know, you rather want to be overcapitalized than undercapitalized. Um, in, in the property space, it's also very very difficult um, because you know the the traditional mindset there is that you invest in those companies for for some type of a, a, a income. And there's no doubt that, I mean, we've already seen some of them suspend dividend payments, et cetera. But again, um, in many of these, uh, again, the valuations look attractive, but it's an absolute minefield. Um, we, we are hoping for survival first right now. So it's good that they focusing on capitalizing the businesses properly. Um, they can always look at a special dividend later um and they can catch up any outstanding payments but you don't want to be making payments right now and then finding yourself bankrupt in six months time so i think it's good i think it's good business practice i don't think investors should um you know because well, what, what we have seen is certain investors disinvest because now they believe the asset class has fundamentally changed it's not the case where property companies or companies who typically pay dividends are going to not pay dividends indefinitely anymore um it's a case that they're trying to navigate in a very pragmatic way, a very immediate near term challenge and things will eventually go back to normal. So I think it's very important to, to, to look through that process. But in general, to get back to the question, I think even though it's painful and it's quite drastic and I think unfortunately it does almost ironically break down a little bit of investor confidence, it should actually be building up confidence that the prudent things are being done at the moment. Thanks, Adrian. One more question. Um, so for clients who have a, a, a growth investment horizon, um, 10 years plus, what should advisors be, be doing with clients? Should they be phasing into the market because of the volatility that's still in the air? Or should we be rather following the, 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 the rule that time in the market is more important than trying to time the market? Yeah, again, I think that's, uh, that, that's one that I think the advisor who looks the client in the eye is probably best suited to 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 gauge that effectively because um, you know, I, I'm, as you know, I've, I've got a side passion for anything in investor behavior like and I always think that it can be helpful to try and phase in because um, obviously it places less pressure on the advice that was given and it, it, it gives the client a sense that you doing a little bit exercising a little bit of caution um, and and applying your mind but at the same time if you look at the if you look at the research there's very little benefit ultimately um, in terms of a return um, in, in terms of returns so it doesn't really matter from a return perspective whether you phase in or not ultimately it makes so little difference but if you if you look a client in the eye and they look very skittish and they want to you know, they've, they've got capital that they can invest. They should be investing because their long-term plans don't look great, um, but they don't want to invest right now. I think the happy compromise is to say, why don't we just phase it in and take it easy? Um, for other clients who are willing to, to say, you know what, I understand there's volatility that's still going to be here for another, you know, X amount of months or even a year or two, uh, but I'm willing to take that on. I understand the risk. I think it's more important for me to be in the market. Then, then, then go that route. So I don't think it's something that you can universally answer in terms of saying phasing ins are good or bad. I think it, it's good for some people and, and, and it's, uh, it's lesser good for, for others who are actually willing to, to enter sooner. Thanks, Adrian. It shows you just how important inv managing investor behavior is, especially in times like these. So, um, you know, I think the work that, that you are doing from, from creating great solutions and the work that um, the advisors out there are doing 
in terms of managing clients' expectations is crucial to be in a strategic partnership. So everyone that's on the call, thank you very much for, for, for listening in um, and participating. I hope you found this insightful and we look forward to engaging with you post this webinar. Have a good Friday. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.